Hello, I'm Pastor Jay, and welcome to another edition of The Agenda, where we deal with all things relevant to the culture, Christianity, and the church. You know, Deborah and I, we, we are together most of the time, and we were riding around the other day, and uh, as we were talking to one another, we realized how much we sound like our parents, because we both saw something that caught our attention, and we said, times have truly changed. And that's really the basis of this broadcast. We take it from a scripture. Uh, that's found in First Chronicles where the sons of Issachar came to David when he was consolidating his kingdom. And the Bible says something very specific about the sons of Issachar. It said that they had an understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. And so we're looking at the times that we live in, the cultural changes that are affecting the church, and that's why we talk about things relevant to the culture, relevant to the church, and relevant to Christianity. And when we had our first broadcast, We talked about something that really rocked the American church, and it happened in two major denominations. The first thing that happened had to do with the uh, United Methodist Church, where there was a major split over the issue of LGB uh, individuals being ordained as pastors. And then a couple of weeks ago, there was a major split in the Southern Baptist congregation over the issue of women being pastors, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight on the set. Is it the will of God that women usurp authority over a man? Now, y'all got to understand, I'm playing devil's advocate tonight. This may not be how I feel, but we're going to look at the Bible, and we're going to discuss this thing from a biblical uh, perspective, but also from a cultural perspective. And I have two awesome guests joining me tonight. Both of them are products of the River of Life Christian Center, and uh, one of them is a pastor, and I believe that one of them is going to be a pastor mm-hmm. one day. And so we have with us Carl. Carla Butler and uh, Hannah Jenkins, and so we'll start with Hannah on the end. Hannah, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what God is doing in your life. Uh, okay, well, I'm Hannah Jenkins. Uh, I am married to Anthony Jenkins, uh, who is also the worship and arts director and slash TD here at the River. Um, well, God is just doing a lot of great things in um, our lives as a family, but for me in particular, I think he's just showing me more of the gifting that he's placed inside of me. And just to be truthfully honest, like it's not something that I have always walked confidently in because I, like you pastor, I don't have a lineage of that in my family. Mm -hmm. I'm actually the first in my family to, you know, even be a minister, you Mm -hmm. know? So um, it's not something that I've always been very confident in, but I'm just learning more and more to just embrace who God has called me to be. And to, as long as I continue to just seek him and allow him to guide me, that is going well. So that's, you know, really what he's doing in my life right now is just showing me how when I lean in on him, how he really just shows up and really mm-hmm. reminds me that he's always there, never leaves me, never forsakes me, no matter how far I may feel that I am from him. Mm-hmm. I remember when Hannah, when you first came to the ministry, you were involved in dance ministry. Yes. And it's just amazing to watch your evolution now because God has really promoted, promoted you and raised you up from doing the dance thing to actually just being a blessing with a dynamic anointing upon your voice and so I am just just a proud pastor to say that you are on the ministry team one of the servant leaders that we have here at the River of Life Christian Center and also we have Pastor Carla Butler uh, who started a brand new church here in the city of Orlando Carla tell us who you are what you're doing and what the Lord is doing in your life Uh, My name is Pastor Carla Butler. Like Pastor said, I am a product of the River of Life Christian Center. I am currently pastor of Divine Outpour Ministries, pastoring with my husband, E. Brian Butler. Um, God is doing amazing things in my life. Hannah, unlike you, um, I come from a lineage of pastors and teachers and Mm -hmm. intercessors. Uh, However, stepping into pastorship no matter how much you've seen it is completely different when you actually have to walk it Mm -hmm. but i have to say that i am excited uh pastoring god's people i I really love it i I enjoy shepherding and i am really interested to see what god is going to do next in my life awesome awesome now just to put everything in context especially me being the moderator because i don't want to be like a two on one team up where they jump on me and beat me up. But I just want to give you a little bit uh, of my history. Um, I was born in 1957 
and I started doing ministry or on a minor level uh, in 1967. I was the superintendent of the uh, the Sunday school, and then I started teaching our teens in church uh, as a teenager. And I said that to say this: the church that that I pastor now doesn't look anything like the church that I grew up in. Um, I have um, a Baptist background, mm -hmm. and as Baptists, we talked about this a little bit before you guys came in. Um, women weren't even allowed in the pulpit. Now, they could do everything else in church. They could sing, they could serve in any other capacity, but they weren't allowed to serve in a ministerial or pastoral capacity. Mm -hmm. And so that was the generation that I grew up in. And I have seen uh, the church evolve over the years um, to the point that we are right now. Again, mm -hmm. discussing what happened with the Southern Baptist Convention a couple of weeks ago where they came out with a dogmatic statement that women would not be allowed to serve as pastors. And again, it caused a split, a major split. Um, the largest church in the Southern Baptist Convention, I think it's Saddleback, with Rick, Rick Warren as a pastor. Uh, that church pulled out of the Southern Baptist Convention, and also another church that I didn't even know was a part of the Southern Baptist Convention is, uh, I don't know the name of Steve Furtick's church, but he also... Elevation. Elevation. What was it? Elevation. Elevation Church. They also withdrew from the SBC. And so, um, again, looking at the culture and how the culture has affected the church, because the church has changed um, over the years and so now here we are in 2023 and so what we want to discuss tonight is what is the role or is there a role for women as pastors in the church and at the end of the day what does the Bible say about that um, and I want to ask you first uh, because you, you're the younger of our panelists here tonight um, have, have you had any thoughts about it have you received any kind of blowback about it have you questioned yourself um, being a potential pastor um, going into what we would call the 21st century church? Um, so as far as like topics of that has come up in the past, uh, nothing to the extent of what has recently happened. Mm -hmm. But um, I, there ha I have heard conversations about whether or not women should be in the pulpit. Um, mm -hmm. I have been a part of conversations where they have said, well, I don't want to go to a church where the woman is the lead pastor or senior pastor. And I've always wondered why. And I know a lot of people, they, they go to that scripture in Corinthians that, uh, you know, or where Paul was talking about, but he was talking to the Corinthian church mm -hmm. and about a, a particular thing that was going on. And I think that's sometimes where we misinterpret the word of God, where we're not doing the history of what was the time, who was, uh, who was speaking and who was being spoken to to really understand and get a you know a knowledge of what was happening i feel that god has called all of us first of all all of us are ministers of the gospel to mm -hmm. go out and teach the good news um, but there are some of us who have been giving the gifting of being a teacher speaker or a pastor and so it's understanding what those giftings are and who you are called to because mm -hmm. not everybody who may be called to be a speaker or a teacher or a pastor is to actually do it from a pulpit you mm -hmm. may be doing a missions you know going out you may be because the church is not confined to the four walls we go out into the world so I just feel like it's really about listening to what God has said and what God has told you to do. And that is what you're supposed to be following. You can't be worried about what other people are going to say, because this is why we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved, knowing the word of God, because other people will come and say stuff. And that's not what God said. You know, you, you said something that I want us to talk about um, mm -hmm. traditional mindsets. And when I say traditional mindsets, uh, Deborah and I serve together. She's the executive pastor here at the River of Life Christian Center. But there are some people. And as a matter of fact, it's only happened with other females where they address me as pastor, but they they address her as either Mrs. First Jackson lady. or First Lady or something mm -hmm. like that. But purposely, they refuse to address her as Pastor Deborah. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it's a mindset. It's it, and, and I've never had a conversation with them per se, but I understand where they're coming from. And uh, and Deborah understands where, where they're coming from. So she doesn't take it as an offense. Mm -hmm. We just kind of hear it and, and just keep on going. But, but Carla, again, the same question to you. When you felt the call to be a pastor, what were any type of traditional thoughts or arguments that you had to deal with? What were some of the conversations or reservations that maybe you had within yourself about assuming that position? To be quite honest, Pastor, I never had any reservations. Let mm -hmm. me tell you why. Unlike you, I grew up in a church 
where women were very active in ministry. They mm -hmm. were pastors, they were evangelists, they were uh, leaders of flocks. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity to actually watch that. Mm -hmm. So there were no reservations because my experience trumped any reservations I may have had personally or anyone may have had about me being a female pastor. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> You talked about blowback. There was blowback and, and still is. Even now I do uh, receive posts on our website. Is that right? Absolutely. With me being a female pastor. Can, can you mm -hmm. tell us about some of those posts and how oh, you dealt with them? wow. Okay, so you're disobedient to the word of God. Now are these congregants that go to your church or people that you don't know or people I that you know? I don't even know these people. They don't know me at all. Okay. But they look for pastors who are females and they try to flood the website with negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as a female pastor, you're going to go to hell. Oh, for that's kind of harsh. Oh, no. And, and, <laughs> and these are... So Jesus didn't die to cover that. The blood didn't cover that, huh? The blood apparently did not cover okay. that. <laughs> now, now... I would say that truly it is a mindset mm -hmm. that people have. And like Hannah said, you're not really interpreting scripture correctly. The reason I didn't have reservations is because I know that this is happening by the Spirit of the Lord. This is not me. Mm -hmm. And one of the word that the Lord gave me to comfort me in all of this is mm -hmm. in Ephesians 4. The Bible said that when Jesus rose, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to the church. Mm -hmm. He says he calls some mm -hmm. to be apostles, not men or women, right. this genderless, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He mm -hmm. said for the work of the ministry. So when we look at what the giftings that he gave to the church, when the Bible speaks of what he gave to us, mm -hmm. it was genderless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes even though we see the word, and I think in some cases even can see that this is genderless because of the mindset that you have been taught mm -hmm. or how your, your church culture when you grew up, it is hard to let go of that mm -hmm. to embrace the fact that what I see here makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. So that gives me comfort. Mm -hmm. the, the Word of God is what gives me comfort even though they're saying, but this says this and this says that. The Spirit gives me comfort mm -hmm. because I think we get so caught up in gender that we forget grace. Because he said, I gave everyone grace for the gift. You know, when, when you talk about gender, I'm gonna go and take a look at scripture when we finish this little piece that we're yes. talking about now. Um, the, the Word of God says that in the spirit there's neither male nor female yes. in the spirit. And then when you look at, when you go all the way back to the book of beginnings, because a lot of things we can get from the beginning if we just look at what God did in the book of Genesis. When God created um, Adam, he also created Eve. Yes. Mm -hmm. He didn't go back to the earth and shape Eve. once. Eve was inside of Adam. She was a part of Adam. And so basically what God did is he separated um, Adam and Eve in the flesh, but then he reunited them spiritually. And, and that's why the Bible says, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, yes. and the two shall become one flesh. And so in the realm of the spirit, um, there is no gender, and, and I don't think people understand this. When we get to heaven, they're not going to be male spirits and female spirits because there won't be any need to procreate. Mm -hmm. And when we minister unto the Lord, we minister in spirit and mm -hmm. in truth. And when you look at the Bible itself and how it's written, because men wrote the Bible in a time when men had a position of dominance, you'll see male pronouns used to describe who God is. But God is neither male nor female, but yet he has characteristics of both. Mm -hmm. The Bible references God sometimes and refers to him as, as a mother, and then it refers to him as a father. And so we have to realize, realize that from a spiritual perspective, there is neither male nor female, but in the context of which the scriptures were written, mm -hmm. um, men have sort of given, or human beings have sort of given rank and positions to males and females. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is what we have to grapple with. In all matters pertaining to faith and conduct, 
That's what, I, that's what I was trying to remember before. Mm-hmm. In all matters pertaining to faith and conduct, we defer to the word of God. And so that's what I want us to do. And uh, because you said one person said you're going to hell and, mm-hmm. and you're being disobedient. So I want us to go ahead and, uh, and grab a scripture. And this scripture is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, Hannah said something earlier that I think a lot of people don't take into consideration when they read the Bible. When I was in the seminary, I never will forget, um, one of my professors said this, when, when you read the Word of God, you have to look at um, who was the audience, mm-hmm. what was the historical setting during that time, and why was that particular text written. And we had a brief discussion before we started tonight talking about the Apostle Paul and his background. Mm-hmm. He had a Jewish background before he came into Christianity, and that played a, a kind of a big role in why he said what he said. But I want you to listen to this. He said, um, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And then he says, what? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that are right unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant still. Can you speak to that? Let me speak to it while you're thinking about it, and ha- and hand you, that'll give you some time to think about it. Um, during the particular time, well, well, before we got into Christianity, in the synagogues, believe it or not, they had two different chambers. They had mm-hmm. a room where women sat, and they had like a rear chamber where, I'm um, oh, sorry, they had a room where the men sat to learn uh, from the rabbis. And then they had another area where women sat. And sometimes, um, and I read this in a commentary, when women didn't understand what was being said, they would begin to ask, what, what does this mean? And, what? and so it, it became like a chatter during the time that teaching was happening. And so Paul was saying, you guys be quiet. And if you have any questions about the law, or, because you, you remember, he said, he said, so says the law in the scripture that I just mm-hmm. read to you. So this is a remnant of Old Testament theology right. coming over into um, the theology of grace. Mm-hmm. And so he said, Uh, maintain order, be quiet in church, and when you get home, if you have any questions, then you ask your, your, your husbands. And then we have to remember as well that in a cultural standpoint, women were not educated at that time. Mm-hmm. They were not even allowed to be educated. Even now, in some Middle Eastern countries, right. I forget the name of the other of religion over there, uh, where women are literally killed. They're forbidden to be educated From at learning. all. And so that is why the, the Bible talks about if you have any questions, ask your husband, because they were not educated in any way. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we really have to look at also, Pastor, is the fact that, uh, like Hannah said earlier, what was going on at the time, why Paul was addressing these things. Mm-hmm. Um, you, the, Paul was dealing with syncretism in the church. Mm-hmm. Okay, you, these these people were new converts. Um, they were dealing with like Artemis, Diana, and all these goddesses. They were worshiping before they were saved, and so one of the issues and that part was of their worship were temple prostitutes. Temple prostitutes, and not only that, but uh, superiority of women mm-hmm. because these were goddesses, mm-hmm. and so that's why you often see him talking about even usurping authority. It was not so much that. I, as a woman, if I minister the word of God, that somehow I am usurping authority over my husband Mm -hmm. because I am speaking by the spirit of God. So both of us must be subject to the spirit anyway, Mm -hmm. you know. So a lot of this was coming from not just a woman speaking by the spirit of God, but because there were so many mindsets and so many things that he had to unteach them Mm -hmm. because they're now in the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And so... Even in other scriptures, he talked about certain things such as, you know, the woman was first deceived. He was saying that because one of the major 
religions that he had to deal with was Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they taught was that somehow Eve giving Adam the fruit to partake of that somehow she was bringing him into spiritual awareness. And so it kind of placed women above, if you will, men. And so he was trying to remind them that's not how the scripture goes in, in the law, in Genesis. Mm -hmm. You see? So a lot of the stuff that he was referring to had nothing to do with a woman actually speaking in the church or preaching, but more so what they had learned that he needed to unteach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you address that? What Paul said in Corinthians about women being silent in the church. I mean, I agree with Pastor Carla. Um, as I was saying earlier, it was it's important to understand all of that, to understand the history, to understand what he was dealing with mm -hmm. um, when he said what he said. And when you don't understand that, that's when you can just take the scripture, you know, as is, and then run with it, but run in ignorance, mm -hmm. you know. Um, during that time, there, like Pastor Carla said, there was a lot of unlearning that had to be done. And it's just like when a teacher comes into a classroom, she has to first quiet the class down, because you're not going to be able to learn any, anything if everybody is talking and they have their exactly. own side conversations going on. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it wasn't so much to be like, no, you're, be quiet, you're not supposed to speak. It's like, no, now is the time to learn. And in order and to listen. learn and to be on top, the things that you have been doing and for me to show you that okay there is a better way there are boundaries mm -hmm. I have to first come in and get you to listen and the only way that I'm gonna get you to do that is if I get you to close this mm -hmm. and open this mm -hmm. so I I feel like it's it comes down to understanding the context behind it exactly. and whenever we're reading scripture we have to understand the context because there's a lot of scripture that is misinterpreted and that is spoken in ignorance because people don't take the time to do the research to mm -hmm. find out what was the the speaker or what was what was going on in that time just like now what's going on in our time mm -hmm. there's a lot of things where we're coming up even to what you were saying pastor Carla where and I feel like this has something to do with what's going on with the, the topic that we're discussing is, is that there is this, um, I don't want to say new age, but the modern day woman, right? Mm -hmm. She's no longer the Susie homemaker in the house. You know, you have working women, you have women that so are you're going about out. The culture now. The yes. culture, yes. And I think the culture has a lot to do with the rebellion that is happening in regards to. Well, that. Hannah, let, let me ask. Now, when I interrupt you guys, I'm not trying to interrupt you. It's just I'm getting older. I have to jump in a thought when I get it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, when, when you talk about the culture, um, we have to remember that at the time Paul wrote these things, there was no King James translation. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like right now I have an entire theological encyclopedia on my phone. Mm -hmm. During that time, there was no New Testament. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or anything. And so he had a very, um, a very daunting task because he has to establish doctrine in cities where people came from, like we discussed earlier, from a heathen background, mm -hmm. where you had goddesses that were worshipped and whatnot. And so he's trying to establish proper doctrine, which would have been appropriate in that day. But when we look at the context of the culture now, like Hannah was saying, is it relevant now? But at the same point, we have something else that we have to deal with, and that's in, um, I think it's, what, what is it, Romans chapter 12, where it says, be not conformed, is that the right one? God is not be not conformed, conformed to this world, world but, but be transformed, transformed by the renewing Romans of your mind. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as it relates to the culture in Christianity, are we allowing culture to shape our theology or should it be the other way around where theology shapes our culture I don't think that is that we should allow culture to shape our theology because God is the same yesterday today and forevermore so mm -hmm. he's never changing his word doesn't change mm -hmm. it's still living alive and well mm -hmm. I think it's more so understanding the culture and meeting them where they are mm -hmm. and once we meet them where they are show them what it is that that God is saying about the things that we're doing so for example when we're talking about women dressing modestly mm -hmm. my question is is what is modest to that person because for some people they may think wearing maybe a lower 
you know, garment, V-neck, that that is modest because they're not showing very much of their cleavage, you know, so it's meeting the person (laughs) where they are and getting them to understand, like, okay, when, when when the Bible is talking about dressing modestly, it's not saying that you can't be proud of the body that you have because that's what women are saying. Now, I am, we're taking back um, the the authority of our body because for so long we've had men dominance telling us Mm -hmm. what we can and cannot do with our bodies right Mm -hmm. this is why you also have a lot of female artists that are singing more what you might call a raunchy song because Mm -hmm. it's them saying oh no i can sing this because this is my body you don't get to tell me so it's it's really about (laughs) trying to take back the authority that Mm -hmm. we feel and i say we because you know all women but this is i feel that a lot of women are just trying to take back the authority that they felt has been stripped of them. But but at what point do you say, whoa? And let me tell you what I mean by this. Mm-hmm. Um, years ago, we used to use modesty cloths. Mm-hmm. Since we've been in this building, mm-hmm. and you know, when women would sit on the front row, we would have these little brown things that we yes. gave them mm-hmm. to cover their legs. And uh, I was made aware of something that happened. It was several years ago when this happened, uh, where one woman said, so I, I don't need that, mm-hmm. you know. And But then on the flip side of that, as we discussed before, I've had women come up for altar calls where it was a huge distraction because I'm trying to stay in the spirit, yeah. right? And and I don't want to see all your bazooms, you know. So I'm <laughs> I'm doing the Stevie Wonder thing, you know, just trying to look around because that is a major distraction to me. And not only at the altar. Yeah. I mean, I'm saved, but I'm still a man. Yes. Right? Um, I've been walking out of church where I just like, oh man, you know, I, I want to be in the spirit, but I'm like, truth be known, she's fine. You know? <laughs> And so, you know, at, at what point do we draw the line? Because we, we discussed this again prior to where Paul talked about um, that the adorning of women should not be with, with the gold and, and the plaiting of the hair. And, and you know, the, the makeup thing. What would church look like mm-hmm. if women came to church now with no makeup on, mm-hmm. didn't do their hair, you know, whatnot? And, and so it, it's it's. It's trying to take this ancient text that we have mm-hmm. and making it and fit. making it fit the culture. Yeah. And the culture is ever evolving. But at what point do we say we plant our flag here? Mm-hmm. And yes, the culture is evolving, but we're not going to go this far. I think, but I think, oh, it, would, it, I think it would have to be with us just uh, in some sense teaching, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just being sensitive about how you teach what you teach, understanding the culture today. Right. So that's because why the Bible says that the older women should teach, teach the, younger the younger women. Right, so mm-hmm. I think I think it's just a matter of teaching. But it's but how It's you how teach. you teach. Because, because a lot of younger women get offended by the yes. older women because of how the older women approach them. Mm-hmm. There's, that's what I'm saying, you have to meet people where they are. How would you approach them? You have to use wisdom. I mean, I remember a time that when uh, we were back at 44th and I was a new mother I got offended by an older mother because she came into the restroom and I was doing something with Skyland and her comment was oh you young mothers just don't know what you're doing and I'm like excuse me That's like a judgmental statement. it's a very judgmental statement and I think that we have to be aware of how we come off judgy because if you're gonna come off in judgment then yes I'm gonna get defensive and if my mm-hmm. defenses are up I'm not gonna receive what you have to say whether it's true or not mm-hmm. so I, I think that we the Bible says to speak truth in love and mm-hmm. I I think a lot of times we miss that love part mm-hmm. where yes you can come and give correction but do it in love it's you like don't I'm have beating you over your head yes. with truth right and then that becomes ineffective right so you know um wisdom is a principal thing right. that's what the bible says mm-hmm. so i think as me speaking as an older woman i can't believe i just said that <laughs> but no, you're speaking you're as an older either. woman <laughs> You would have, I would have to exhibit some kind of wisdom in how I approach. Number one, get to know the individual first, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay? Because then wh- what I can say to you as a young mother or what I can say to you at 40 or what I can say to you at 50 are three completely different things and three completely different ways of approach. So I think we just have to use the wisdom that comes from the spirit. We have to use wisdom in everything. Mm-hmm. Wisdom in forgiveness, wisdom in speaking, wisdom in communication, wisdom is the principal thing. So I think if we can approach them in the right way, then we can bring that change. Mm -hmm. But I do often feel, Pastor, that sometimes in Scripture, we do try to make Scripture fit in the culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that has created an issue Mm -hmm. as well. And I guess that's that's what I'm saying. At, at, At what point 
do we say we're not going to be slaves of the culture as it relates to Christianity? Because the culture is ever changing. It's, okay. it's ever evolving. And at, and at what point do we say, okay, we draw the line here? We draw the line when it is an offense or contradict contradicts the word of God. That's where we draw the line. Mm -hmm. right? Because if the word of God is supposed to be everything for faith and conduct, then when we see something happening in the culture that is affecting the church, that's where we draw the line yeah. because the word is the final authority. And I think it's also with breaking that down, though, because mm -hmm. you as as new people are coming into faith, babes in Christ, mm -hmm. it has to be broken down to their level of understanding. Yes. For example, there's uh, I can't think of exactly where it is in the Bible right now, but the Bible talks about how if um, if you know something that you do offends your brother that you Don't shouldn't do, do. do it. You shouldn't mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. But that comes with maturity in spirit and mm -hmm. understanding. Same <laughs> thing with the dress, right? Yeah. So as a woman, if I know that certain things I wear could be not offensive, but could lead my brother right. into a negative mindset, then I need to be, you know, out aware, yeah. out of love. What mm -hmm. I, but some women would take that. Oh, so I'm supposed to cover up because he don't know how to go. It's not that he doesn't know how to guard himself, but because we are accountable for yeah. one another. Mm -hmm. If I know that something my brother is struggling with this, then I'm going to do what I can to help him hold that's accountable. A good, that's, good. that's a good answer. And yeah. and and I just feel like that's also where I can also help him, or you know pray whatever like lord give me the wisdom on how i can help him in this area so this won't always be something that he's fighting with because we right. all have issues Absolutely. that we're dealing with and we're supposed to be able to come to the church confess our sins one to another so we can help one another because we need each other's help Absolutely. what you said is very important because the way that paul addressed that was there was a, a discussion that came up about eating food that was offered to idols mm -hmm. and um Paul said, "If he, he said that it's not about the meats and the drink things with me, but if what I eat offends you, right. then for the sake of your faith and the weakness of your faith, mm -hmm. I won't eat it because of you. Mm -hmm. Yet and still, I know it's okay for me to do it. And it made me think about something that happened a long time ago. Um, I was playing spades at a church picnic, mm -hmm. and an older lady came up to me and she said, Pastor, you, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that because, you know, this is demonic, da 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 I had never looked at playing spades as being demonic, but it bothered her. Mm -hmm. And so for the sake of, of her conscience, yes. at the end of the game, um, I, I stopped playing. Mm -hmm. But I want to bring up something else, Carla, because you have a very unique position as it relates to the Word of God and what we're talking about tonight. And uh, there's a scripture, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 3. And, and as it relates to men and women and how they relate to one another, this transcends the church because it also goes into home life. Yes. Um, the Apostle Paul says this, he said, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man and the head of Christ is God, talking mm -hmm. about the order and spiritual hierarchy. Yes. So as, as at home, I'm assuming... <laughs> I'm assuming that Brian is the head of the yes, house. Yes, he is. Okay. Absolutely. But um, but <laughs> it, it's kind of funny because um, Deborah and I will get into some arguments at, at the house sometimes. <laughs> and I'll say, at the end of the day, don't forget I'm your husband, yeah. but I'm also your pastor. <laughs> right. Um, how do you deal with that at home? Because in the context of the church, mm -hmm. your husband now is to submit to your authority in that spiritual position as pastor. But then once you get home, are you pastor or are you wife? Absolutely, I am wife. I'm glad you brought so, this up. I wish Brian I am was here. So, oh, <laughs> well, he would tell you the same thing. I'm so glad you brought this up because actually this is a discussion that Brian and I had pre-pastoring. Mm -hmm. um, and, to, to, and it wasn't even about making him feel comfortable. It was mm -hmm. about him, both of us, understanding the role that I was about to walk in. Okay. Again, I'm going to go back to the fact that I grew up watching women in ministry mm -hmm. pastor and being submitted to their husbands. So I had very good examples. So it is not hard like people think. Mm -hmm. As long as you understand the role, as long as you understand the place, as a matter of fact, God is a God of order. Mm -hmm. 
When I am preparing or even speaking in the church or ministering in the church, mm. I feel that we are all submitted at this point to the Spirit of God. I am not Brian's wife in that moment. I am walking in an anointing under the Spirit and I'm speaking what the Spirit says to the church. Mm -hmm. The moment, Hannah, I, the, I get off of that pulpit and we say amen, mm -hmm. I am Brian's wife mm -hmm. and I submit to my husband. Mm -hmm. So at home, there is no pastor unless she's preparing for the word. Mm -hmm. I submit to my husband. And I think that the more that you, because for some reason there seems to be a mindset that a female shepherd is somehow over her husband. And I don't know, I don't understand where it comes from. Well, but in, I in the church, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you as the pastor yeah. um, tell your husband to do something, he should submit to you, right? In the church? Yeah, in the context of church. But is it, but how am I telling him though? Because you're the senior you know what I'm pastor. Yeah. I am not, I'm the senior pastor, but I'm not speaking to him as one in just authority. Because even the Bible says we're not supposed to lord over God's heritage. Mm -hmm. So the authority that I have as a female pastor or even a male pastor, the authority that we have is more of a role and responsibility mm -hmm. that we have. So when I speak to my husband or any other person in the church, I'm going to speak to them all the same. I'm going to be gentle because that is my nature. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I read a scripture. Um, I don't exactly remember where it is. I think it's First Chronicles 34, maybe. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But there's a woman in the Bible. Her name is Halda. Yeah. And I, I said, I, I'm saying that to say, Pastor, that I often think that we we mix marriage with ministry. I think we try to take marriage into ministry. Mm -hmm. One of the things you find about Huldah, she was a prophetess. Mm -hmm. And the king of Israel at that time, they had found the scrolls and mm -hmm. they needed someone with understanding to be able to tell them what the words meant. And so the king's people went to Huldah because she had understanding in the scriptures. These are men going to a woman to understand scripture. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible says that she was married. Her husband was, she, she was married. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you can be married and still walk in ministry. Mm -hmm. And being submitted to the spirit of God will make you be submitted to your husband. Mm -hmm. The more you submit to the spirit is the more submitted you are to your husband. So I think even with us having that understanding mm -hmm. and speaking about it, letting him know and thinking about, okay, people may come to you and this is what they're gonna ask you mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm a pastor. Mm -hmm. And we talked about what, what the responses would be, what we really feel about it, mm -hmm. and my home is at peace. Well, let me ask you something. I wanna ask Hannah this, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can chime in too, Carla, because yeah. we're kinda of running out of time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a lot of the blowback um, against women being pastors comes from a sense of male insecurity or sometimes female insecurity where they really have a problem with with because you understand what I'm saying mm -hmm. sometimes women have a problem with other women taking a role of authority mm -hmm. and then sometimes I mean I've seen some good women they're just good preachers mm -hmm. and I think and, and maybe this is a judgmental statement that sometimes men are kind of insecure because this woman is doing this thing really better than I did do mm -hmm. you think insecurity plays a role sometimes? I think it can. Um, I think it, it can because you see it in marriages where a woman mm -hmm. is making more money than her husband. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll have a problem with it if he has an insecurity. So I, I do believe that insecurity does play a, a part in that. And instead of just acknowledging that it's the insecurity, we want to go to scripture to justify, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that insecurity that we have. But I, I do think that it plays a part in it. But I, I, I think it all comes down to us all understanding our role. Back to what you were saying, Pastor. Pastor Carla, mm -hmm. in regards to the scripture tells us that we've all been given gifts. We've all been called to do certain things and we are all a part of one body mm -hmm. and every member of that body is important. Mm -hmm. There is no one more significant part than the other. My I can't tell my big toe you're not needed because right. it is. And so I think that we get so caught up sometimes in the titles. We get mm -hmm. so caught up in the position that we fail to think about the fact that we were placed here to be to work together we need each other to survive like i need you to survive because i need you to survive mm -hmm. but i need you 
so I can survive. We work together. And I think when we the further we get away from that and and we allow culture to play a lot more into mm-hmm. it, because like I said, in today's culture, we have women who are doing a lot of big things. Right. right? Mm-hmm. When we allow culture to play a bigger part than it's than it's necessary then we get further away from the ultimate purpose which is what god placed all of us here to bring him glory Mm -hmm. how is what we're doing bringing him glory that's what it comes back to because in all that we do all that we do we're supposed to be giving him glory and that we're supposed to be seeking the kingdom first like Mm -hmm. how how is how is a separating you know from a church because a woman is a pastor how is that kingdom minded how is that kingdom business how is that bringing god glory and i think that that's the questions that we need to be asking ourselves when we are making decisions Mm -hmm. and when we are making moves and saying that it's for god okay if it's for him how is it bringing him glory and how is it doing what we were called to do well let me ask you this we talked about it from a man's perspective being insecure uh, or maybe he has insecurities about um, a woman being a pastor because really she just does it well with the spirit of excellence. What about when women approach you with, uh, because sometimes like like with Pastor Deborah, you mm-hmm. know, there are some women that, that don't call her pastor. Do you think that's insecurity from a woman? Where do you think that comes from? I think is it a tradition or, or what? I think it's a combination. Again, I think some women also have gone through trauma. Mm-hmm. In, in throughout whether it's their childhood or their upbringing I think that if they were never affirmed or if they were never told like to feel confident in who they are that it they can grow up into adults who are easily threatened by somebody else mm-hmm. who's doing the same thing if mm-hmm. you're a person who is suffering from what they say imposter syndrome or a person who is a, a people pleaser you just want everybody yeah. to like you because nobody likes rejection right nobody mm-hmm. likes to, to be disappointed about things so when you're growing up with these own insecurities securities of your of yourself and you see this other woman who now again Mm -hmm. with the culture we're like oh a a queen knows how to fix another queen's crown Mm -hmm. but it's not a lot of queens out here that's trying to fix each other's crowns some Mm -hmm. of them trying to knock those crowns off and they're doing that jealousy insecurity what what do you i think it's i think it's jealousy and Mm -hmm. competition Mm -hmm. in comparison comparison Mm -hmm. women have a, a problem with comparing themselves with each other. Mm-hmm. And I have and a so statement, comparison kills contentment kills. and rivalry ruins relationships. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so sometimes I think with the women, that's what it is. It's a jealousy and it's competition. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what drives it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I want to touch a little bit on the man pastor. Mm-hmm. I do feel like sometimes it's insecurity. Mm-hmm. I feel like sometimes with the roles, and I'm saying roles because I think we get so caught up in the title Mm-hmm. Right. And so we feel like this title means you're higher than I am. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what has messed up some of the men in the church as it relates to women pastors. Um, and I think when the Lord gave gifts to the church, I think we have to see them as roles, mm-hmm. not titles. Assignments. I, yes. And mm-hmm. I think that's an issue because if you're saying, OK, you're a pastor, so I'm here. You're a prophet, so you're up there. Mm-hmm. That is not what. We're one in Christ. Right. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we're one in Christ. I just wanted to touch on that. And but with the women, I definitely think it's jealousy, uh, a little bit of insecurity, but yeah. competition. Yeah. Women have a tendency to compete with each other. And sometimes I don't even think they know that they're competing. You know, it's just. Right. And and while you were talking, Pastor Carlo, what came to mind, I was thinking about um, Hannah and Penina. Here it was. Mm-hmm. Hannah was barren. She couldn't have any children. Mm-hmm. But Penina was always provoking her. She always had something to say mm-hmm. to her. Yes, still, Penina was having all these kids. She was still jealous of Hannah because of the love that Elkanah had for right. her. And mm-hmm. it's just like that Hannah wasn't in competition. Hannah just wanted to have a baby. But right. because in Penina's mind, she had an insecurity of the fact that, oh, he must love her more. She's not right. producing for him, but he still giving her an extra portion there was jealousy there and i feel like that same spirit that was back then is still roaming around today in in women absolutely well listen thank you guys for joining us both of you ladies for joining us i'm just excited to see what god is going to do in your lives in the future because you're both anointed vessels of god uh ladies and gentlemen if you want to hear hannah's latest sermon thriving in the wilderness (laughs) go by our youtube channel she turned it out and uh carla tell us how we can get to your church so currently we are having church services uh every other week at Mm -hmm. 7018 forest city road we have it at 2 30 p.m do you have a facebook page or any place that people we do have a facebook 
Facebook page. You can visit us at Divine Outpour Ministries. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, everybody, thank you for tuning in for another broadcast of The Agenda, our brand new podcast at the River of Life Christian Center. Until we see you guys again with another provocative subject, may God's riches and best be yours. God bless you.